thank you so much for joining us for holistic treatments and PMDD or holistic therapies and PMDD, excuse me. Um, following this event, you're going to get an email or if you're watching a video, you'll see a link at the end of the video to fill out a survey and it's really quick. It's just a couple of quick questions and it's really helpful for us to build better programs and uh, provide, just really provide us with the feedback so we can continue to provide relevant that, that is good for you. So if you'd be so kind to fill that out at the end of this presentation. Also, if you're joining us on the uh, computer interface, you'll see in the chat box, um, I noticed, I noted in there that if you have questions, thoughts, comments, post them in the chat box. Our two presenters today will be answering those at the end of their presentation. Um, I've also posted in there two helpful documents that our presenters will be going over today. Um, and those are for you to download. Again, if you're doing this on a video later or you're on the phone, you'll get an email following this uh, presentation. Um, or there'll be links at the end of the video for you to download those two forms. So I just said a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our guest today. Uh, our featured presenters. First up, I would like to introduce, excuse me, why? This is the fun thing about live events is trying to organize everything. There we go. I'm really excited to introduce to you Jenny K. Long and Kim Sudi. Is it Sudith? That is. Sadif. Okay, yeah. I want to say sudden death for some reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that. Yeah, but um, I am not going to disparage your beautiful work and body of experience by trying to <laughs> your background, but I'm going to turn things over to you. Um, Jenny Kay, I'll introduce you first, and I'm going to mute myself now. I'm Jenny K. Long. I am the peer support director at Gia Alamon Foundation. I'm also a holistic psychotherapist. Um, and a clinical suicidologist. So I, I, in addition to working at GAF, I work for Kesed Wellness, a nonprofit in Colorado that's committed to providing affordable, accessible mental health services. So I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much for joining us, either right here in the moment or joining us later as you watch online. Um, I wanted to start by sharing a little bit of my story. So. I have lived with PMDD for many, many years now. Um, and back around my 20s, 19, 20 year old, when I was in college is when it really peaked and got to its worst. Um, I would have spells for about two weeks at a time, as you all know, luteal phase, where I would actually collapse onto the floor from anxiety and panic that, that I later learned came from PMDD. Every month, my relationship would just crumble, and I would become convinced that my partner was my enemy. And everything that was said between friends or with my partner or family, I would take it in some strange way and, and become my own worst enemy. And so I started to notice the cycle that my life falling apart, my relationships falling apart, and my body even collapsing onto the floor in panic um, happened every three weeks or so. And it would last two weeks. And I started to figure out that it was very much linked to my menstrual cycle um, in that luteal phase period from ovulation to bleeding. And that helped me to put words to my experience and get support, the support that I needed. And so a lot of what I'm sharing is, it's things that helped me in my own journey. Um, it helped me go from not functional to functional and even to really enjoying my existence. Um, I went from having thoughts of suicide every month to maybe dealing with that every once in a while now, um, but knowing now how to cope with those thoughts. And so I do want to talk a little bit about cure versus recovery. And so for me, I realized that PMDD was part of my life and I started to get to know it. Um, I often call PMDD my personal monster, but in some ways it's also my personal ally because it gives me information about what I need to do to take good care of myself. And so I finally got to the point where I wasn't trying to um, 
just delete it from my life because that didn't work, unfortunately. I wish I could have just deleted PMDD from my life. But now I really uh, embrace a recovery mentality that this is something that I'm gonna have to grapple with probably for, for the rest of my life until menopause comes. But it doesn't have to take over my life and destroy my work, my relationships, my friendships, my relationship with myself. And so recovery to me is the perspective yeah, that this is going to be a part of my life, but it doesn't destroy my life, but I have to maintain it. I have to stay vigilant and on top of my wellness and mental health care, or I could relapse and it could become um, life destroying again. So my baseline is different now. Back in the day, my baseline was really high. There was lots of thoughts of suicide. There were those relational struggles I talked about. Now my baseline is much lower, but in times of stress, it might pop back up a little bit. And so I have to keep, my, keep maintaining my recovery and my wellness to keep that baseline low, if that makes sense. So the primary thing that got me onto the path of wellness was starting to pay attention. Like I just said, I started to notice that these symptoms were exacerbated during my luteal phase. And I wanna go to John Kabat-Zinn's definition of mindfulness. He says that mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So paying attention to our experience right now, on purpose, but without judgment, without this harsh, critical voice saying, this is what I'm experiencing and I am bad, right? So instead, this is what I'm experiencing. It hurts and it is painful, but I am not bad. And this experience is trying to tell me something I need to know. So for example, when I am in shame, when I am overcome with feeling like I have no worth, no goodness, that's telling me I need to take care of myself. I actually need to do the opposite and be kind to myself. So paying attention without judgment, with a lot of self-compassion. And as most of you know, one way that we pay attention to our PMDD is by tracking, right? There's a lot of really great apps out there to track your cycle. And one of the documents that Amanda shared with the group is a tracker that I came up with to support um, my counseling clients and myself. So I'm gonna pull that up right now and, and share my screen for a moment to talk you through it. So one thing I realized was that PMDD affected every single part of my life, right? It wasn't just, it affected my uterus a little bit. No, it was every part of my life. And so that's what I try to pay attention to. How is my luteal phase affecting my relationship with my partner? How is it affecting my relationship with my friends? How is it affecting my emotions? And what's happening in my body? So I'm gonna pull that up. So at the top, you just put the day, today's date. And then what cycle day are you in? So the first day of the cycle is always the first day of bleeding. Ovulation is typically around day 13 to 15. That's different for for some women, um, women who struggle with PCOS, that ovulation um, can be a little bit off in the cycle day. Um, but first day of bleeding is always cycle day one. And then we look at what's happening in your body. How heavy is your flow? Are you, are you flowing right now? What's your discharge like? Are you experiencing physical symptoms, cramping, bloating, headaches, those kinds of things? And then it's a space to journal a little bit about what's happening in your relationships. Sometimes we really want connection and sometimes we really need space. Um, oftentimes PMDD in the luteal phase can lead to a lot of tension and fights. Um, what is your sex life like? Are you wanting sex? Are you having sex with or without protection? Those kinds of tracking things. Um, but really wanting to see is the uptick in fighting and tension connected to a particular time in your cycle. 
And so over the months, we can start to notice, you know what, always around cycle day, you know, 17 or so, my partner and I, my friend and I, we just have knock down, drag out fights. And so if we can start to bring in mindfulness around that experience, we can start to um, also um, increase our coping skills, our ways of relating, figuring out, oh, actually I need to take space for a few days or I need this kind of connection in this time. And then we look at emotions. What kind of emotions are you experiencing? And then that one to 10 intensity scale. One is hardly at all, 10 is a lot. And those, that list of emotions actually comes from dialectical behavioral therapy. So noticing when we feel shame and how much we feel and how do we react to that feeling of shame noticing when we actually are experiencing compassion for ourselves and how do we um, experience more of that or nurture that more and then safety so are you experiencing thoughts of suicide how strong are those thoughts one means hardly at all maybe they pass by um, 10 means I'm going to kill myself today or soon. And so starting to notice, when do those thoughts of suicide escalate? Um, is it related to a particular time in your cycle? Um, there's a space here to note if you acted on those thoughts. Urges to self-harm. Did you act on those urges to self-harm? How are you maintaining your safety? And then if we go down, there's DBT skills. So we're going to talk a little bit more in a moment about DBT skills, but that's dialectical behavioral therapy, and it just offers us some tools and techniques for coping with these really hard emotions and these really hard moments in our lives. And then this is just a repeat of the first page. I'm going to go back. Okay. So taking care of our mind, our mind, body, and relationships begins by paying attention to our mind, body, and relationships, noticing what patterns happen for us and how to cope with the hard stuff and nurture and increase the helpful stuff. So let's talk about a few things that help us on that path. Therapy. So it goes by different words, right? Therapy, psychotherapy, counseling. But basically, sitting down with a professional that you feel connected to and safe with. Someone who has the professional experience to walk this journey with you. With PMDD, we tend to have two weeks of really, really hard time and then a couple of weeks of relief. And it's important, especially when we're just starting therapy, that we we go to therapy during both of those times. Because in the luteal phase, oftentimes we're putting out fires, we are surviving our crises, right? And then during the other time of the month, we need to work on the deeper stuff. Like what is making this extra hard for us? What do we need to do to get to the next level of health and change that baseline? So we need to make sure we go consistently, whether we are in PMDD mode or not. Therapy provides a, a space for us to be exactly as we are. You know, we show up with our brilliance and our goodness and also our struggles and fears and suffering. So it's a place for us to just show up exactly as we are. And research shows that just that changes the structures of the brain in ways that help us live healthier, more fulfilling lives. Therapy is also a place for us to identify any patterns like we've been talking about, those cyclical patterns, um, and in any core beliefs that we have that are keeping us down. So our brains get used to thinking in a certain way. So just like if I needed to get up right now and walk out the door, I have to do so many different things, right? I have to like lean forward, activate the muscles in my feet, stand up. That's ridiculous. If I thought about all of those different tasks every time I needed to do something mundane in everyday life, I wouldn't get anything done. So our brain creates shortcuts called neural pathways to help us get things done in a more efficient way. 
the thing is, it does that too with more abstract things and emotional things, relational things. And so our brains often get used to thinking in the same, in the same way. So if PMDD time has arrived and there is a um, benign but difficult interaction with someone, my brain is going to be triggered and those neural pathways are going to start shooting all of these messages around. And if I have a negative core belief system, it's going to automatically start telling me I'm not loved, I'm not worthy, I don't belong, I would be better off dead. And so therapy can help us notice those core cognitions and then start to change the way that our brain processes those messages and the way our brain becomes our enemy and attacks us with a bunch of lies. It's the way our brain tricks us into thinking that we are bad. So therapy helps us identify patterns, core beliefs, automatic thoughts. If you wanna look up more information about automatic thoughts, CBT has a really great um, list of cognitive distortions. So I'm just gonna type that here, CBT cognitive distortions. And this is simply a way that our mind plays tricks on us. There are 10 different categories that CBT talks through. So that's things like all or nothing thinking, like I am either all good or all bad. I don't live in the middle as a true human being or catastrophizing one little tiny situation means that my entire life is over and destroyed. And so if we start to notice those distortions, we can start um, talking back to that tricky brain and saying, you know what, I actually don't believe that as much as it feels true. Yeah, so someone said displaced anger, projecting onto others more than self-loathing. Yeah, that can happen too. So sometimes we turn our anger towards ourselves. Sometimes we turn it towards others. And this is where mindfulness comes in, paying attention. Is this anger, what information is this anger giving me? Is it telling me that this person is doing something that is unsafe or unhealthy and I need to get space from them? Or is it my brain kind of making up a story um, that isn't quite connected to my true relationship with this person? So learning skills. So we've talked about CBT, right? The cognitive distortions. And then wanna talk a little bit about DBT. And both of these are third wave cognitive behavioral therapies that really take mindfulness as the primary um, technique for change or primary technique for healing and getting us towards wholeness. So I'm gonna share my screen again and pull up a list of DBT skills. So DBT skills fall into four different categories. And DBT was actually developed by a woman named Marsha Linehan. She's a clinician. And she has shared openly about her own struggle with thoughts of suicide, her journey towards healing. And so she created all of this based in her own experience, her personal experience, but also her experience in, in supporting others. So DBT, DBT looks at core mindfulness skills. So really developing our ability to be aware and compassionate at the same time. Our interpersonal effectiveness. We know PMDD, I've said this several times already, affects our relationships. It tends to play out most in our most significant relationships. So there's a few skills here in how do we navigate those relationships when we are in our luteal phase. And then emotion regulation skills. When those emotions are so intense and they're kind of tipping us over the edge, how do we cope? And there's a whole list here of practical things we can do. So making choices that match our values, do something challenging that helps us feel in more control. For me, that's, so I don't currently have a dishwasher, which um, drives me crazy. 
and I have a child too. So we always have all of these dishes everywhere. And when my emotions are really heightened, I need to do something challenging. And for me, doing all the dishes feels challenging. So I just go in there and I get all of it done. I clean the entire kitchen and it helps me to feel a little more in control. So those are just some practical things we can do to get us through that moment. Distress tolerance. As we all know, PMDD comes with a lot of distress, right? And so these tips help us build up our ability to cope with distress. So noticing our breath as it comes in and out, taking a break from the situation, um, doing pro progressive muscle relaxation, also, DBT teaches us radical acceptance. So like I was saying before, this idea of recovery versus cure. So I had to come to the point personally where I accepted that PMDD was part of my life. And so that takes a great amount of acceptance. So this is part of my life. And I can figure out how to interact with this um, this diagnosis in a way that gives me as much life as I can possibly have. Maybe my luteal phase is always going to be kind of hard, but if it cannot get to the point where I try to kill myself every month, that would be great. And then if it cannot get to the point where I feel like I have to leave my partner, and then if it cannot get to the point where my job falls apart, right? And so over time, it just gets a little better each month. But it also takes a lot of work, a lot of vigilance and mindfulness. So using DBT to increase our skill set, using CBT to look at our core cognitions, and a belief is just something we've thought over and over and over again. So if we change the way we think, the theory goes, is we'll change also the way we feel. And it can be really helpful to work with a therapist on these things and not try to do it alone. So another helpful thing about therapy is that um, someone is there kind of seeing our accomplishments. So I have a 10 month old daughter. And if I just look at, if I just watch her all day, I don't see her bones stretching or her mus muscles growing or her body getting taller. That would be really creepy and weird, right? But if my, if my dad comes to visit every few months, he notices how much she grows because he hasn't been seeing it every single day. It's kind of the same with our emotional and mental health. We don't always see our growth because we live with ourselves moment in and moment out. But a therapist, a counselor can help us with these goals and then help us see our own growth, help us track our own growth and kind of be our cheerleader in that. So I want to um, shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about acupuncture. So in my practice, I combine um, therapy, acupuncture, and yoga. And that was the, those were the three things that really helped me personally find a lot of healing. Um, and in times where I did one without the others, my healing didn't really happen as much. I really needed that holistic approach of mind-body relationship. So... I specifically use um, auricular acupuncture. Um, full body acupuncture offers so many benefits, um, works with the endocrine system, the whole, the whole self. So, but I'm gonna speak specifically about auricular acupuncture because that's what my certification is in. And that means it's the needles in the ears. So there's five needles in each ear. Um, this is called NADA, the NADA protocol, N-A-D-A. So I wanted to talk through those points. And so these are actually things that you, you can apply pressure to your ear without a needle. If you want to work with these points a little bit, it's most effective if um, an acupuncturist or an, a not a specialist does the needles in your ear. So the sympathetic point is inside the ear in this little part right here. 
And that works with the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Um, it balances those two systems. And so what I've noticed is if I'm ever in a panic attack, that point gets me out of a panic attack faster than anything else. You know, it takes a lot of breathing and a lot of crying and a lot of um, melting down to get through a panic attack typically but that can help me get out of it and it balances the nervous system pretty quickly. It gets us out of that fight, flight, or freeze mode. So when we are in high anxiety, high stress, this, this back part of our brain, the reptilian brain kicks into gear and it puts us in survival mode, which activates these feelings of fight, flight, and freeze. So Maybe that's when we start fighting with the people we actually really care about, or we get really dissociated and start collapsing onto the floor, like what happened to me? So that would be the freeze. Um, so we need to start to notice, am I in fight, fight or freeze? Some things that help us know our heart rate gets really high. We feel our chest pounding. We can feel our shoulders clenching. We can notice that we're fighting other people or we're fighting ourselves or we just get really, really spacey. So this sympathetic point helps us get out of that mode. Other things that help are those DET skills, breathing, paying attention, progressive muscle relaxation. Um, distraction can, can help a little bit if we if we put that energy to work. So if we are in fight or flight, that means our body is pumping lots of adrenaline and cortisol, our muscles are activated. We need to do something with that energy or it'll probably just get taken out on ourselves or others. So that's a good time to like wash all the dishes or go for a run or go for a walk. Um, but that point works with that, that energy as well. Shen Min is the point right here in the top of the ear. And in Chinese medicine, it's called spirit gate. So it's that place of our life force energy. It helps us, it helps relieve anxiety. It helps relieve um, feelings of depression. It also treats insomnia and stress. Um, this point Shin Min also helps um, with lower abdominal circulation. So I would imagine that that could also help with our flow. It also can help with migraines, but for some people it can induce a migraine. So if that point starts to make you feel a little headachey, you just need to ask the person to pull it out and then the headache should sub subside. So spirit gate, this is our life force energy. So Chinese medicine works with mind, body, spirit, just they just do that normally. <laughs> Here in Western culture, we kind of have to do a little extra work to wrap our mind around that concept. But if you ever feel really spacey or dissociated or like you're not really in your body, that point can help you bring, help bring you back. It's, our, it's bringing our spirit back into our body. The kidney is the next point and it's up inside here. So the kidney, if you um, don't happen to remember from biology, helps remove weight and control fluid balance in our body. So this point strengthens the um, functions of the kidney. It strengthens the lower back. A lot of us have some pain in our lower back when we are menstruating or before the bleeding begins. It tonifies the kidney and it helps relieve feelings of fear. PMDD can feel really scary. It can make the whole world around us feel scary. And that, that fear can come out of nowhere, it seems. All of a sudden we're ovulating and terrified of the world. Um, so that point can help with feelings of fear. Uh, filters blood and detoxifies the body. That's what the liver does. Um, and when we work with that point in auricular acupuncture, right over here, sense of filtering the blood and detoxifying, it also regulates the free flow of qi. So in traditional Chinese medicine, is our energy. It's how we move and be in the world. It's what animates us. And so that point helps regulate the flow of our personal energy. It can also help with dizzy spells and fainting. Um, 
and strengthen the body in that way. Helps with anemia. So some of us, when we start bleeding, our iron gets low and we feel anemic. So supports that, relieves bloating, relieves feelings of depression, strengthens digestion. Okay, so we're gonna go back to what we were chatting about before. So um, it looks like Amy asked if I could spell that. I think you may be talking about moxibustion. I'm not sure if you were asking me to spell something different. But I want to talk a little bit about moxibustion for endometriosis. So a lot of women who have PMDD also struggle with endometriosis, which means very, very painful periods. And so moxa actually comes from this wild growing plant. Uh, when I lived in Pennsylvania, we would go harvest it. But basically, uh, it's a wild growing plant called mugwort. And so they take mugwort and ferment it and that turns into moxa. And so an acupuncturist will take some moxa and sometimes they'll use a needle or sometimes not, but they'll put the moxa on the abdomen where the uterus is and they'll actually light it on fire, but it doesn't burn your skin and it helps that blood to start flowing and it, takes, it helps with those symptoms of endometriosis, that painful, painful period. So that's another way that acupuncture can be really supportive. So like we were saying, you can go to a full body acupuncturist or there are therapists who also have um, auricular acupuncture specialization and that's what I have. So I do therapy, but then I can also do those auricular acupuncture points as well. So you have a couple of options, um, full body acupuncturist or you can go to a not a specialist. So if you look at someone's credentials, you know, when we have our name and all of those letters after, if they have an ADS, that means that they can do the auricular acupuncture. So I want to shift into talking a little bit about yoga and how that can be helpful. So studies are showing, and just from personal experience, talking with lots of women, a lot of us who have PMDD have histories of trauma. Almost all of us, probably. And so that history of trauma creates a lot of complexity in our relationship with our own body. It also feels like our body is railing against us a lot of times because it's spurring all of these symptoms of PMDD. So yoga is an opportunity for us to reconnect with our bodies in a space that feels safe and in a space that's not judgmental. So trauma actually gets stored in our bodies, but that Rothschild has a lot of um, great work around this. Um, and so even if we don't, we're not thinking about our trauma, our body can remember our trauma and it can trigger us in some ways. So this is a way, yoga is a way of moving with our body, breathing and being mindful of our body to help relieve some of that trauma. So it's like going, it's like having another relationship with ourselves. So, right, we like went through all of that trauma. We went through all that hard stuff. It's like we need to court ourselves or date ourselves again to get to know our body in a new way and remedy that relationship. Um, yoga also helps to balance the nervous system. Again, when we are in luteal phase, when we are in our PMDD mode, it really brings up that survival brain, fight, flight, freeze, and yoga can help relax that and get us out of fight, flight, and freeze mode. When we've been chronically in fight, flight, freeze for so long, our baseline is so high, our nervous system is like always um, worn out and always like ready to um, put out the next fire. And so this helps us to relearn how to let our muscles relax. So therapy plus acupuncture plus yoga has really helped me um, through my own symptoms of PMDD. It's relieved a lot of the most painful aspects of PMDD for me. And I've seen it also um, support a lot of women, my clients on their journey towards healing and wholeness. Um, and so we will have time at the end to answer any questions you might have um, from this part of our talk. But I want to now turn it over to Kimberly Suddeth, who is a registered dietitian. 
She's so brilliant and thoughtful and compassionate. And she's going to talk a bit about um, how food can increase symptoms of PMDD or help us relieve some of those symptoms. So I'll, I'll turn it over now. All right. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Kim Sedith. I am a registered dietitian and I uh, currently uh, am founder of a food blog called Unrefined RD, where I share vegetarian recipes. Um, a lot of my focus is on plant-based whole foods. And so I will touch on that today, um, especially in the sense of um, stress and how that relates um, with PMDD. So I'm really excited to dive into this. And it, again, if you have any questions towards the end, I um, will answer them at the end. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to start with the why behind the importance of nutrition and PMDD. So it's important to talk about nutrition because a healthy nourishing diet it can it has the ability to shorten the phase of PMDD or reduce the severity of symptoms. Um, because the body is in a stress state, in this case with PMDD, um, usually a chronic, uh, like chronic stress where it's, it's a very consistent level, um, the need for nutrients are higher during the stress state. So if if the body doesn't get a, these nutrients in the amounts that are needed, it can actually prolong the amount of time that the body stays in a stress state. So nutrients have the ability um, to either, to again, shorten that phase or reduce severity of symptoms. Um, and when we continue in that stress state, the body creates inflammatory responses that can um, exacerbate these symptoms. Um, so nourishing the body is really important. It's, it's important to have the right foods as an effective treatment in the management of PMDD. So um, there's a few guidelines I'll go over that can help manage these symptoms. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about foods that can reduce symptoms associated with PMDD. Then we'll go into foods that can um, worsen symptoms associated with PMDD. And I know uh, Jenny and I talked a little bit about cravings, so I'm going to get into that. And I saw a few comments too. So I, that is a big one. So I will talk about cravings and, and kind of strategies to help with that as well. Um, so first, let's get into foods that reduce symptoms associated with PMDD. Uh, number one, the most important uh, focus is going to be a plant-based diet. So Studies have actually shown that women who eat a plant-based diet high in vegetables, fruits, nuts, grains, and legumes, they have fewer symptoms associated with menstrual cycle disorders. Um, and the reason behind that is a plant-based diet is very nutrient dense. You're going to get a lot more nutrients and less with, for less calories than you are in a lot of animal-based foods. And a lot of plant-based uh, foods are anti-inflammatory versus pro-inflammatory. So that's something I'll kind of touch on here and there about um, inflammation. That's a big uh, component of stress um, and, and prolonging stress. So a plant-based diet, it, it, it doesn't mean uh, necessarily vegetarian or vegan. Um, those are terms that are, they ex exclude certain foods. A plant-based diet is more, I like to think of it as the focus. What's your focus? So if you're focusing on plants, then when you're planning meals, you want to have that as your like entree or the center of your meal um, instead of say um, animal-based foods like chicken, beef, things like that. Um, and so I know at least here in America, um, that's really hard. We always think of entree. We think of meat what's our meat and um that's just kind of a shift with plant-based diet is when you're planning meals to think of um, legumes and grain whole grains and things like that as your entree versus a meat um so again um when when that is your focus you're getting you're going to be getting more antioxidants fiber 
vitamins, minerals, complex carbohydrates, healthy fats, all that good stuff, um, which is crucial to keep the body's stress levels in check. Um, so the transition to a plant-based diet, it can be kind of difficult, especially if, uh, if your mind is used to your entree being a meat. Um, a lot of times, it can be really hard to think of an, another entree. Um, so there's a few helpful ways that can make that transition easier. Um, these are to cut back slowly on the daily amount of animal food consumption. So say, you know, for dinner, instead of um, having two pieces of chicken, trying just one, and then trying to slowly cut back. Um, another is to substitute animal foods with a plant-based food. So instead of um, a hamburger, trying a black bean burger and looking for, you know, a black bean burger recipe that you'd like to try and um, as a replacement. And the last one is to um, eat animal foods less often and eat plant-based foods more often. Um, so a lot of meatless Mondays is a really big one um, that people think about, but also like weekday vegetarian, if you wanted to go without meat during the week and then on the weekends kind of be liberal and kind of do whatever you want on the weekends. Um, that's another option as well. Or you can designate certain days of the week that you want to make 100% meat free or, you know, just something that kind of helps you keep a schedule on, you know, how to, how to cut back and reduce that. Um, so as far as plant-based diet, that, those are some helpful strategies to start out. Um, and then a, number two that's important when talking about stress and management of PMDD symptoms is a, a real whole foods diet. So it's possible to eat plant-based foods, but for them, if they're highly processed, then that's also anti-inflammatory. Um, so a whole foods diet is important as well to follow because this type of eating can decrease inflammation and help fight off stress. Um, a whole foods diet is basically foods that don't have the artificial additives and foods that aren't highly processed. When I say highly processed, it's usually things that have been refined during the manufacturing process. And then sometimes they get, you know, little things here and there added back. There's lots of preservatives, um, food dyes, things like that, that, um, Again, the FDA has approved those foods, but we really don't know what kind of responses our bodies have to them. And they have been linked with, um, with a lot of conditions like heart disease, um, ADHD, um, asthma, cancer. So they're just things that, um, you know, eating too much of can, can be really um, hard when dealing with stress. Um, so, um, again, they've highly processed foods. They've been um, associated with increasing inflammation in the body. Um, it doesn't, so there's a few things as far as artificial additives that can be helpful to try to stay away from when you're trying to um, decrease inflammation and help fight off stress. Uh, number one is trans fats. These are also called partially hydrogenated oils. So when you're looking at ingredient lists, um, that's one thing that um, when you're looking at the list, if it has that on there, then it does, it may not say trans fats on the nutrition facts label, which that label is, um, it lists out the calories and the fat grams and um, different nutrients and how much. Um, so on that label, it may say zero grams trans fats, but if the ingredient list says hydrogenated vegetable oil, then it does have a certain amount. It may not have that per serving size, but it does contain it if you, you eat over that. Um, and thankfully, the FDA um, has finally decided to, um, I, I think by 2018, um, trans fats will no longer be um, allowed. So... Um, that's great, but it's taken, you know, a hundred years to get there, but we're good. Um, so that's one thing to be aware of just until 2018. And then, you know, hopefully we won't have to worry about that anymore. Our next big thing will probably be high fructose corn syrup. Um, so that is another one is high fructose corn syrup. Um, research has actually 
found that this type of sugar um, change the way that our body processes that is different. It, it kind of makes our body go into a, uh, we want to accumulate that and store it um, versus using that for energy. So high fructose corn syrup is, is another big one to, to, you know, and that storage, when, when we store that in our, and it becomes our fat cells, uh, the more fat cells we have, you know, if it's over um, the body weight that we need to be, then that can lead to inflammation as well in the body. So um, another one is color dyes, um, you know, yellow 40 or red 40, yellow dye, blue dye, those types of things. Those food dyes um, have been linked with certain um, conditions. Um, I can't say if you know, that in inflammation is one of them. But again, it's not something that, you know, in my opinion, can be helpful to the body to be consuming on a regular basis. Um, another one is artificial sweeteners and then sodium nitrate and nitrites. Um, nitrate nitrites have been linked with cancer. Um, artificial sweeteners, again, the body processes them differently. And, um, you know, at this point, there hasn't been enough research to really um, show that they're effective in weight management. Um, for, um, I th for some people who do have diabetes, it can be effective and effective. But other than that, it really hasn't been shown to be helpful with manage weight management. Um, and again, it's taken, it takes our government a long time to really figure out whether or not to include certain foods. So um, it's always best to just stick with the foods that we've known for ages that we know that haven't been manufactured in a laboratory, but that grow from the earth. And so that's just the main mindset is um, a real foods focus, a plant-based diet focus. These are foods that, um, you know, for many, many years that the body has relied on. And um, so again, they've, and they've all been found to help uh, deal with an inflammation in the body. And so that in turn will, um, can help decrease stress. So um, now I want to go into the foods that can worsen symptoms associated with PMDD. Um, there's a forward X that can be helpful to memorize uh, as these are the common offenders in menstrual cycle disorders. So it's S-A-C-S, S stands for sugar, and then alcohol, and caffeine, and sodium. These are common, uh, like I said, common offenders in menstrual cycle disorders. They have been associated with an increase in the stress hormone cortisol and a decrease in serotonin, um, which I call the feel-good hormone. Um, so sugar can, it is associated with inflammation. It can lead to inflammation if we take in too much, an excessive amount. And again, what I'm saying here is excessive amounts. So, and a lot of times that's kind of where cravings come in, comes in is we tend to overconsume. you know, not that sugar is a bad thing in and of itself, but when it's in when it's in excess, then yes, it can be associated with the inflammation uh, response. So um, sugar has also been found um, to be linked with anxiety, cramps, cravings. It can actually um, make cravings worse. You know, it's kind of this terrible cycle where we crave sugar and then we eat it and then we, you know, keep having cravings. So um, that's one to, to um, limit as well as sodium. Sodium has been linked with, um, you know, fluid retention, bloating, breast swelling, and tenderness. So having a sodium restriction during that um, luteal phase is helpful to um, kind of decrease those, those unnecessary symptoms in the body. Um, the other one is caffeine, like I mentioned. Um, it's been associated with irritability, anxiety, and insomnia. Um, and again, those are symptoms during that phase that can just not, you know, it can really just worsen your experience, you know, in those two weeks. And so maybe if your regular caffeine consumption is 
two cups of coffee a day, trying to do just one or, you know, cutting back during that, during that time can be really helpful. Alcohol is another one. Um, although alcohol has not, for some people, it can actually, it has been found to be helpful and for some not. So it's, it's one of those that's, there's not enough research to show that it should be, um, but it's based on your personal, how your body reacts to it. So if you do notice that um, alcohol exacerbates some of your symptoms, um, whether that's migraines or whatever, you know, definitely something to cut out during that phase, um, during the luteal phase, and, you know, um, trying to limit how much you consume. Uh, one thing I did want to note about alcohol is it can um, deplete the body's B vitamin stores if, if in excess. So um, that is something to definitely just drink in moderation um, just to make sure because B vitamins are really helpful for, um, uh, I'll get into that, but for um, helping the body with uh, fighting stress. So now I'm going to get into cravings. Um, this is a common issue for a lot of women with PMDD and menstrual cycle disorders as a whole. So um, I'm really excited to talk about this today. The body is, is under a lot of stress during PMDD, and it makes sense that cravings are going to happen for many women. So the problem is the types of foods that we crave. Um, it's usually one of the foods that worsen symptoms of PMDD, uh, salt, sugar, alcohol, caffeine. So because, and we tend, a lot of times there's the cravings, um, I automatically go to ice cream, chips, pasta. It's usually simple carbohydrates that, that we crave. Um, and one reason behind this is the body is actually desiring um, to, to boost serotonin levels. Um, and one way it does that is carbohydrates. So when the body is in a stress state, um, the cortisol levels are going to be higher and your serotonin levels um, are going to be um, are going to be lower. So in order to boost serotonin, the body relies on an amino acid called tryptophan. Um, this is a precursor in serotonin pr production. So carbohydrates actually help uh, boost the tryptophan um, crossing the blood brain barrier. So essentially it just Carbohydrates just allow tryptophan to enter, um, to be made into serotonin. Um, so to make tryptophan, um, or for um, tryptophan, certain vitamins and minerals are also required. Like I mentioned, B vitamins, um, zinc, magnesium, calcium, those are important. Um, vitamins and man. Um, so carbohydrates are not a bad thing. The problem is where we're getting our carbohydrates. So um, instead of simple carbohydrates, going with complex carbohydrates is ideal. A complex carbohydrate is basically, it takes the body longer to break down that carbohydrate than say a simple carbohydrate. So it's just the way that the body metabolizes it. Usually it, it contains more vitamins and minerals. It's higher in fiber. Um, some examples of these foods are going to be 100% whole grains, beans and legumes, and your starchy vegetables. Um, so those are um, really great um, sources for complex carbohydrates, especially when you have those cravings and you know that's what your body needs. Trying to get it in a healthy way is ideal. Um, so there's a few helpful tips for um, combating cravings. Um, number one is trying to keep them out of sight. So the saying out of sight, out of mind can be really helpful, especially when you know that there's a food that you're going to be going for during that phase. Um, keeping it out of your mind, you know, out of your sight, um, keeping it out of the house or um, packing it away in the pantry, um, something like that can be really helpful. But also displaying foods that, that are good for you, that are nutritious, that you, know, you could go for whenever, you, whenever the craving strikes or you know, uh, whenever you're hungry. Um, so keeping it out of sight. And the number two is building upon that, like building a new healthier habit. 
um, habits are hard. They take time to, to build. So this is one that um, it doesn't happen overnight. It does take time, but it's a very successful strategy. Um, and again, if you take away unhealthful foods, it's that can only be helpful unless you replace it with something because your body needs something, but um, just not what you're, um, you know, the craving if you know you're going to be taking in excess. So some examples, um, nuts or bean dip and whole grain pita chips instead of um, like regular um, potato chips, those are helpful and they have a lot of nutrients um, and um, associated with anti-inflammation. Um, instead of ice cream, maybe trying a 100% a fr fruit sorbet or something that has, you know, it's made with all fruit. 100% um, whole grains, again, that's really important. If like crackers, making sure it's 100% whole grain. Bread, 100% whole grain. Um, I can't stress that enough. You know, it's, it's a difference between refined and, you know, the giving you all the nutrients that you can possibly get. Um, and then another example is instead of milkshakes, going for maybe probiotic drinks, um, herbal tea instead of soda. These are just some helpful alternatives when, when that craving does hit that you can try to go to that's going to provide, um, again, that's going to not put your body in that inflammation phase and going to provide nutrients that can actually help you um, shorten that phase or severity of symptoms. Okay, and then really last, and then I know we're getting close to time, so, and I want to have time to answer questions. So supplements, um, there's one supplement that has been shown to reduce um, symptoms and it's the only supplement, there's been a lot of studies of others, but this is the only one that's actually, um, they did a meta-analysis and it showed that um, it, it's helpful. It's called chase berry, um, also called Vitex. It's a fruit of the chase tree found in Central Asia and the Mediterranean. Um, its mechanism of action is it stimulates the pituitary glands to release a hormone, a certain hormone, which releases more progesterone and normalizes that progesterone estrogen ratio. Um, so this can re help relieve symptoms such as bloating, irritability, depression. Um, the amount needed in the studies was 20 milligrams daily, and they did that for three consecutive menstrual periods. Um, and they found that it decreased symptoms in, by 50% in one randomized controlled trial. So this can be really helpful. Um, and the only caution I have in this, it's not, it's contraindicated during pregnancy. So for sure, um, it should be discontinued during pregnancy. And then most supplements, they provide well over 20 milligrams per serving. So when you're looking at supplements, try to go with one that is on the lower end because they haven't looked at toxicity levels and things like that if you you know take more in than you really need to to be effective so um, that's another thing to look at when you do, when you are looking into supplement that this herbal supplement is um, go with one that's kind of on the lower end just in case you know to note any side effects so that is all I have um, I let me see if there's any questions? So is Chaseberry safe when breastfeeding? Again, pregnancy, breastfeeding, they kind of do go hand in hand. It's, it's not recommended, but always, always talk to your doctor first before, before um, doing that. Adrenal support with Vitex and take all month long. So that's awesome. Yeah. So um, I didn't think about that, but having an herbalist on board in your, in your treatments can be really helpful to get their input on, on what can be helpful for you. And do you, and, uh, do you recommend, do you take Chase Berry daily or is it just during the luteal phase? So they took it daily. Um, so a h entire month for three consecutive menstrual periods. So it would be one of those long-term herbal supplements um that you would take every day okay 
Um, and my, my other, and then, sorry, sorry, I have a couple questions to follow up on the cheeseberry. So yeah. I know many women, I mean, with PMDD, we're very fearful of anything that's going to mess with hormones because we don't know, is it progesterone that's causing it? Is it estrogen? Is it both? Um, yeah. So I think I liked your advice, start low and see how you yeah. go. And are there any contradictions with other medications a woman might be on or other supplements? with trying chaseberry? Um, that's a good question. I did not come across any side um, medication herbal interactions, um, but I will have to look into that and do a little more research and get back to you because um, I, I didn't come across any in my research, but um, it is definitely something to consider, especially taking other medications. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. always something to look at and be aware of. Well, I was just wondering if like a woman's doing like a progesterone, uh, like a cream, like a, a lot of women will try the bioidentical progesterone cream or they'll be on an oral contraceptive. So I was right. just like, that is kind of where I'm more th mostly thinking um, yeah. on a hormone therapy and then adding something that's going to stimulate the hormones. So I'm just curious what the, if there is an interaction. Yeah, de um, I would definitely ask um, your provider who does prescribe the medication if that's okay. And um, definitely always something to consider is herbal medication interaction, um, just to make sure that both can be effective in your treatment. Absolutely. And then I actually had a personal question. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you were talking about artificial sweeteners. Um, what about like stevia, or stevia, if I'm saying that right? Oh yeah, stevia and um, truvia. Those they're different, but yeah, they um, come from a plant that I recommend in moderation most time for um, for people, just because it's still um, it it's like other um, it's like other real like cane sugar and things that we process from a real food. We process that down to, you know, just the sugar. Um, again, I always recommend that and other sugars in moderation. But yeah, that's a, um, that is a, a good alternative to things that are made like, um, like Splenda and things like that, that are, they're manufactured in a lab versus, you know, getting it from the plant. Yeah. And then when you talked about um, complex carbohydrates and whole grains, um, we hear a lot about like gluten and inflammatory properties of wheat. Do you want to touch upon that a little bit? Yeah. So this depends on individual. Again, some individuals are sensitive to wheat. Um, other people have no issues whatsoever. So this is something that if Again, um, whether that's trying a um, an elimination diet to try to pinpoint where um, your body is reacting, or to see um, to see a specialist who can an, an allergy specialist who can uh, kind of help diagnose that. Um, but for some people, um, again, it's it depends on the individual whether they have an inflammatory response to wheat or not. Um, but yeah, it, it does happen for some people. They do have intolerances, allergies, things like that to wheat. So definitely something um, to look into. Yeah, because I know like for myself, um, when I was pursuing holistic and alternative therapies, it was eliminate first wheat then it was, and dairy were the first yes. two. And then they're like, if you can do sugar, refined sugars, but in PMDD, which I really loved all the alternative snacks you gave that you can yeah. set with a salty, sweet craving. That's so intense. To yes. Set your best efforts. Um, those are really great. Really. Those were really great tips. Yeah. Sure. Well, good. I'm glad those were helpful. <laughs> yeah. And it uh, looks like we have a couple more questions. And you guys feel free to ask questions too of Jenny Kay if you didn't get a chance earlier in the session. Um, it looks like... Uh, oh, fish oil. Yeah. Um, so I didn't touch on omega-3 fatty acids, but that's another um, omega-3s, which is where that fish oil, look kind of the important property that that contains is omega-3 fatty acids. They have been associated with anti-inflammation in the body. So definitely something um, 
to consider would be taking a fish oil supplement. But even better than that is eating fish, you know, at least a fatty fish like salmon um, three times a week. Laura would like to come live with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes, so Laura. sweet, Laura. Uh, what is Amy asked about? I can't even say that word. Does that is that word familiar to either of you, Jenny K or Makuna Prurian? I haven't heard of that, Amy. Let's see. Um, yes, Jenny K, I will unmute you. There you go. <laughs> I have a voice. I haven't heard of that either. Yeah. yeah. Is that a supplement? Amy, is Makuna, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but is that a supplement, Amy? Oh, Amanda, you probably have her muted. Oh, okay. I don't know which one. Let me see. Amy, 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 I'm finding you. I thought maybe she'd type in the box. You know, I don't see her name on the list. She might have dropped off or must or might be on audio. So she may oh, okay. be on. Yeah, it says I think she left. So um, that's something for us to research, though. We'll definitely Google that. Yeah. I've never heard of that. Um, so um, Melissa asked, are there certain herbal supplements, vitamins, vitamins, all women with PMDD or all people, I think it's great use, should be taking? Um, I think it's a great question because we get told calcium, vitamin D, magnesium. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. Um, my main strategy is to try to get it through diet as much as possible. I do, but again, you know, when your body is in that chronic stress state, your nutrient needs are higher than the average healthy adult. So um, it is hard to do, but um, I see a lot of times when we take vitamin supplements, we don't feel like we have to get them through foods. So maybe trying to change that mindset. I certainly think, um, like you mentioned, vitamin D, uh, B vitamin supplement, um, those can be really helpful. Um, to make sure that your body is getting the nutrients that you need. But the number one strategy is to try to get that through a plant-based whole foods diet and make, you know, that being your focus and then supplementing along that if you feel like you need to. That sounds great. And, then and I want to address the question that Lauren just posted. So I want to go back and clarify a little bit. I think that there are some really great techniques and tools from CBT, but and I'm certified in CBT, but I don't use that as the primary modality with people because I don't feel that it's holistic enough for PMDD. Um, some may, some people may find enough relief or enough support just through CBT, but I actually um, tend to, um, I use a very psychodynamic relational approach and use um, DBT skills, um, perspectives from ACT, ACT therapy, and then the cognitive distortions and, and, and techniques around automatic thoughts and negative core beliefs from CBT. So I think that a combination of things can be um, helpful. And Lauren, no, I am not rich. <laughs> I just try to like survive and pay my rent, honestly. <laughs> so, um, but, Oh, okay. In the UK, it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I work at a nonprofit, <laughs> which I am very grateful for, but no, I'm not rich. No, I think she was asking too, maybe you have to be rich to afford the therapy. I think that's more what she was talking oh, about. I see. <laughs> yeah, like, and, yeah, because she was saying in the UK, you have to, pri you, have, you only get eight weeks unless you private pay. And then in the United States, as we know, I mean, mm -hmm. coverage is abysmal, although... Lord knows what's going to happen with, with the current healthcare reforms, but um, at least in the U.S., you are provided a certain amount of mental health care services um, under all, all current plans that are available. Whether you can afford those or not, yes, can be tricky, but uh, Jenny Kay, where she was talking about she works for a nonprofit. Uh, Gia Alamon Foundation, although it doesn't provide therapy th services through ours, um, but through Kessid Wellness, where where you work, that's, I mean, mm -hmm. you can say what you're doing there. I, it's amazing what they're, we, we see all these nonprofits trying to fill that gap, close that gap in mental health mm -hmm. services to provide low cost uh, therapy. 
Yeah, so at Chesed, we really, really are committed to making sure that services are available, the quality, high quality services are available to everyone, regardless of the ability to pay. So anyone in the Colorado area, um, we're happy to do a free consult if you'd like to um, come in and, and talk about the services we offer. Um, but so part of therapy, so therapy involves working with a therapist, right? But then it also involves the work we do on our own, our homework. And so when I talk about using CBT and DBT, those are some tools and techniques that you can use on your own to process um, how you're thinking and and build up your skill set. So that DBT resource that Amanda shared with everyone, that's a list of practical tools you can use to cope when times are tough. And then when times aren't tough, those are skills that you can be practicing so that you build up your new habits of when, when I have this thought or when, my, when something happens with my partner or a friend, those things are now your habits. They're your go-to ways of coping rather than the unhelpful things we tend to do to cope that actually makes things worse. So that's how you could use DBT. How you can use CBT on your own is look up those cognitive distortions and just start to notice. Um, if my thoughts are spiraling in an anxious um, way, then I wanna look and see, are any of these distortions happening? Is my mind playing tricks on me? Or is this actually true? Which in my personal experience, my mind tends to play a lot of tricks and most of them aren't true when I'm in my luteal phase. So I start to believe that I'm the worst human on the planet, that everyone hates me, my partner's gonna leave me, my job is gonna fire me. And those are actually cognitive distortions. Um, it's not reality. Um, so that's one way you can use the CBT. Um, on your own at home. Right. I think one of the, I wish I had the opportunity to DBT when I was personally going through therapy. I did a lot of CBT for postpartum depression and for uh, PMDD. Um, I think the two things I took that have still guide me are, you know, you can only control the moment you're in. It's like, let's stop the clock. And so when I was in panic, my husband would say to me, what time is it? And I would have to find a clock and so I, it would just stop you in that moment when all those thoughts are spiraling and it didn't stop everything, but it definitely pulled me out of that distortive thinking um, for a moment and kind of ground you a little bit. Um, something else I wanted to say, Jenny Kay, that I love you said earlier was uh, it's important to do these things in and out of the luteal phase. Oftentimes we wait until we're in crisis to seek therapy. Um, and when everything is distorted and it's much more amplified, um, I think uh, a great way, something again, I took out of my own CBT therapy was my uh, doctor said to me, she's like, you know, you go through life, it's like holding a beach ball underwater. You hold it down as hard as you can and you have to really focus to hold that underwater. But the minute you look away, it's gonna pop up and smack you in the face. So it's really important to, you know, like you talked about most women with PMDD, we have, we have a dual diagnosis. A lot of us have PTSD. A lot of us have a history of trauma and those things become very amplified when we're in the luteal phase. So it's really important to try to, to treat and, and address those issues as well in and out of PMDD. So we're not just always in a crisis and that's when we're seeking help. And a lot of times when you're in crisis, there's, you know, our immediate resources are going to be like a lifeline, um, you know, the National Suicide Lifeline or G. Alamon Foundation soon to be, will be able to offer those. Um, but it's really good to get therapy, you know, as often as you can. I love therapy. Get it as often as you can. <laughs> um, does anyone else have some questions they wanted to ask? I know we've gone a few minutes over. Um, so if you think of something and you want to pop it into the, the chat box there. Uh, ladies, is there anything uh, that you wanted to leave us with today? Some, some parting thoughts. Oh, for you and Kim, do you have anything you wanted to add before we go? Oh, it looks like we got another question before we hang up. Uh, is there any research on PMDD as con and contraception? As in, do people who have never had the pill have PMDD? Um, 
anecdotally, I can say, yes, there are women who have never been on the pill. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know of any studies that have been done, but uh, it's a, there's really interesting research that has come out that women who there is a higher instance of depression later in life. Um, they didn't specify what type of depression. They didn't say reproductive depression or menstrual mood disorder. Um, but there are studies that show women that have used hormonal contraceptive earlier in life do have a higher risk of uh, mental de of depression when they're older. Um, fruit contains a lot of natural sugar, but how much should we have in our diet? I think that's a question. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a good one. Um, I usually recommend that any natural sugar, any natural food that contains sugar just as is, is totally fine to not, you don't have to count that or, you know, keep track of that. Um, added sugar is the thing that I usually recommend keeping track of. Um, I think the heart American heart association re recommends no more than like a hundred calories from added sugars a day, which is, it's pretty small. It's less than like a, a 12 ounce soda. So, um, so total added sugar should be at a minimum. Um, and, but the main thing is fruit, uh, dairy, you know, those things have natural sugars in them. And as long as you're keeping that, you know, balanced, then um, that's fine. The the added sugars, um, you know, again, I'm going off of what the American Heart Association recommends, which is um, for women, I think it's it's 100 calories from added sugars um, per day. So again, less than like a 12 ounce soda. Um, but yeah, as if you're going as natural as possible, then it's it's actually, you can actually meet that range, so. And then uh, Laura asked about this is a good question because I have a smoothie every day. <laughs> Smoothie's okay. <laughs> Bloodstream quicker. Um, yeah, so when you do blend foods, it does, again, if you're blend, it depends on what you're blending. Like if you're blending an entire banana versus like you're adding fruit juice or, you know, so like if it's a whole food that you're just adding to your blender, you're going to, I mean, your body's going to break that down like it would a regular, like, you know you eating that banana um so again with the like fruit juices things that have been extracted from a whole fruit those are obviously going to go into your bloodstream quicker um than say you know a whole food that you eat um and then again portion size that's a big one is just making sure that your portion size is appropriate for what you need Awesome. Well, thank you all so, so much, Kim and Jenny Kay. Just, I mean, the wealth of knowledge you've shared with us today. Thank you. Thank you for giving us yeah. your, time and your experience. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, again, if you were joining us uh, live over the phone, on Twitter, thank you, Laura Murphy, for doing our live tweets during the session today. It's really, really helpful. So thank you. Um, definitely visit our website, gallamon.org or gallamonfoundation.org. View our upcoming events. And actually, a recording of this session will be available on our website when you go to Life with PMDD under the support tab. Or um, also, if you go under events under past events, this, this video will be available as well as on our YouTube channel. And then we'll always share across our social media. I will be sure to include links to both Kim and Jenny Kay's websites. Uh, by the way, Jenny Kay, I love your new website. It's gorgeous. I haven't seen it. <laughs> And you have a beautiful blog, Kim. I love it as well. And uh, yeah, and we'll be sure to add all the things we talked about, uh, the documents that were shared and any relative links, we'll put those on there as well. So thank you all so much for joining us again today. And if you'd be so kind to fill out that survey, you're gonna get in your email, or if you're watching this later on, there's a link at the end of this video. It's really invaluable for us. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for everything you do. And we look forward to seeing you next month for Life with PMDD. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.